All right, thank you very much. Um, let's get started again uh, with, the, with the, the dialogue. So the way it's going to work, I'm going to give you, is that we're going to ask those that want to say something orally, uh, you can form a line um, at that podium. Again, as we mentioned earlier, we're going to try and get to all the questions as possible that we can get to. We're going to be alternating between someone speaking orally and me reading a card. Okay? So uh, we're going to start with a written card. I'll read the question. Um, and then we will alternate and go to the um, spoken word. Okay? So this is not addressed to anybody, but we'll let's see who wants to take it. The question. Can you read the question? I, I have them here. Oh. Oh, that's right. I got your mic. People can't hear it. Yes. Let me try mine and see if it works. I'm pretty loud. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. I'm pretty. I'm gonna try, but I'm pretty loud. So, all right. Here's a question. Why is only college education considered education? Why are some jobs or skills considered better than others? Anyone want to take that? <coughs> I don't know that anybody's used the word better, uh, but it is certainly true that some skills are more highly remunerated, more highly paid than other skills. Uh, and that's not built into law or religion or physics or anything. What fundamentally determines how much your skills are worth is how much people value what you do. Uh, and so if you are Heaven forbid, if you are in need of orthopedic surgery and you find a brilliant orthopedic surgeon uh, and you ask yourself, how much is it worth to me for him to take care of my injury? Well, the answer is that's worth a great deal and you'll pay for it. On the other hand, if you find a brilliant lawnmower to take care of your lawn, you may say, well, that's worth, you know, that's worth considerably less. And moreover, if I don't actually have the very best person to mow my lawn, how much does it matter to me? Uh, and if the answer to that is, not very much. You know, it's okay if the lawn is a little bit ragged. It's okay if it's a little bit shorter than I like it. Um, if that's your answer, then the skill that's involved in mowing the lawn beautifully is not very valuable. So what determines value is precisely how much people who take advantage of the work of your skill are willing to pay for it. I guess I want to address this to uh, uh, Claire. We, you mentioned about uh, that to pay for this living wage, uh, taxes are taken from the citizens to pay for it, or it's a, an imposition on the uh, business that accepts it. And it sounds to me like Jeffrey just said, uh, the individual, when you're paying for a lawnmower, you want to get the very best bang you can for the buck. The business, when it's paying for a service, wants to get the best bang for the buck. But somehow now when it's government and they've taken the money from me, I'll have to go to jail if I don't pay it. So I'm, I'm, I'm at risk here. That money's taken forcibly from me and then it's good enough for government work to pay them and overpay them. I noticed in third world countries, the best jobs are only government jobs, and I think you're heading that way. Would you address the uh, irresponsible use of taxpayer dollars? Well, thank you. I'll, I'll try to I'll try to respond in a way that that it, um, it is relevant to the issues that we're talking about here today. Um, so, taxpayer dollars are used to pay for services that people want. Uh, we have a library, um, we have uh, public safety, we have fire protection, uh, the city provides water, sewer services, um, a whole host of services that the people of, of this city want. So those, those tax dollars are being used for things that people in this city value. One of, one of those, and what uh, was the impetus for me being here, it was um, custodial services at city rec centers and how those people are paid. 
So um, your tax dollars are going, if you do live in the city of Boulder, I don't think you do, but if you did, um, you know, your tax dollars are going for things that the, your elected representatives um, uh, have decided are services that are important. So, and what the living wage does is say that, that we won't just let there be a race to the bottom and provide these services at the lowest cost possible, that there is some humane floor to what people should be paid. Um, it's not completely outsized, it's not the difference between paying a lawnmower and paying an orthopedic surgeon. We're not saying that, that we're gonna compensate people at a level that has no relationship whatsoever to the value of those services or to the skills needed. I, you know, Paying somebody at 125% or 150% of the federal poverty level is hardly a lavish wage. What it is is an amount that provides some dignity to the people who are working full time. And, and I think in this country and in this city, what we believe in is that when you do work full time and you provide a service that people think is valuable, that you ought at least to be able to put a roof over your head and, and, and some food on your table. Thank you. So the next question will be a written one. Um, and this is more of a concept. It says adding $2 per hour would be $320 per month, which would probably be spent in the community. Um, what is the value of that? And we want to. Go ahead. It's for anybody. It's for anybody. <laughs> have any. I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Adding two dollars. So, is that an important concept? That the money that we would add would go back into the community through the living wage. The money we would add. So, it's adding two dollars per hour would be three hundred twenty dollars per month. That would probably that would probably be spent in the community. Oh, I, I don't know if they would spend it on goods within the community. It would just enable uh, the workers who are providing the service for, services for the city or county to live a, a life of dignity. That was the purpose behind uh, raising the equivalent of $2 per citizen. Okay. These macroeconomic effects are very easy to overstate, um, and ultimately they have to be negligible. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that if you give people who live in, some people who live in Boulder $2 additional or $320 additional a month, and perhaps they do spend it in Boulder, but that money came from somewhere. That $320 is not being spent by whoever that money was taken from, and there's no reason to believe that that money in the hands of the original possessor wouldn't have been spent in roughly the same places. So the macroeconomic effects of these things in general are awash. They're not important. I have a question for Mr. Zach. About some of the information that you presented, I noticed that there wasn't any data provided, and in particular I'm referring to your first uh, slide with the two big circles on it, showing that most people that are low wage earners don't work. Uh, I'm wondering where that came from, if you could provide your source. It's contrary to data that I have seen, and it's also contrary to my experience um, I worked with low-income families, and of the 320 families that we served last year, uh, none of them did not work. They all worked at least 40 hours a week. Usually both family members work. So I'm, I'm wondering, where did you get that information? Uh, my immediate source was a working paper by Richard Berkhauser of the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Truthfully, I didn't have the time in preparing for this to uh, create my own statistics on that. Uh, but those are national numbers, and I think those are pretty widely accepted. Uh, I, I disagree. I, it would be helpful if you could present local data with hard numbers on it that would be more meaningful than, than assumptions. So we're not going yeah, to be a debate. It's, uh, it'll be just let them uh, say their answer. Thank you. Um, there is data. In fact, and despite Professor Sachs's youthful appearance, I think he's relying on what um, the, the um, outmoded and, and historic um, uh, demographic of minimum wage earners. Uh, there, there are, the data that's much more recent is that by 2012, 60% of low wage workers were between the age of 25 and 64, and only 12% were teenagers, whereas in 1979, 
26% uh, were low wage workers and under half were in their prime working ages of 25 to 64. Um, a study of the effect of the living wage in Milwaukee um, and uh, some other communities uh, looked at uh, Illinois uh, and uh, who is it that is receiving public benefits and who would benefit from the living wage found that four-fifths of uh, working families that were, were receiving public assistance were actually supported by a full-time worker who was employed at least 35 hours a week. So um, that data tells us that those who we think of as being um, uh, under resources and not having um, support uh, actually are working full-time. Uh, they're just not able to support themselves. Thank you. So now a written question. What ideas do we have for influence, influencing employers who limit workers to part-time um, variable hours that don't allow for reliable minimum or annual uh, living legal peg budgeting to hourly wages, not to annual salaries? So let me try again. What ideas do we have for influencing employers who limit workers to part-time variable hours that don't allow for reliable, minimal, and living livable peg budgeting. So, for example, uh, speaking of hourly wages and not annual salaries. So, how can we? So, I guess what I'm trying, to, but the question seems is, how do we influence those employers that will limit hours uh, of their employers, to, um, and that those limited hours don't allow employers to actually have a livable budget? What can we do to influence them, if anything at all? I'll take a stab at that, um, just in the context of a living wage. Um, you know, I think you can structure it just the, the way you do to include health benefits and paid sick leave, which would be that you, you peg the minimum wage to whatever percent of federal poverty level the community decides is appropriate, and then um, perhaps have some escalator if the employer um, it is unwilling to provide full-time employment or limits them to part-time hours, they may have to pay a higher percentage of FPL, for, uh, perhaps. So, um, but you know, you ha I think you do have to be careful with that issue, although I know that's a big problem for contract employees. Some jobs simply don't require full-time work. And so I, I think it's, it's a pretty blunt instrument and I think it's, a, it's an area to be careful of. Go um, I my guess my main question for Dr. Zacks is you presented that a lot of the data and effects of minimum wage laws are unstudied and I'm wondering why that is. Uh, economics is a field that is known for being uh, really advanced in its statistical methods and it seems like I'm in the wrong field if there's that much to be done. That's funny. <laughs> I guess I'm not sure which field you're in, uh, but there are always questions in economics that are not answered. In this case, I think the fundamental question is that it's very easy to go to a restaurant and ask, how many workers do you have now before you raise the minimum wage? And then go back a year later after you raise the minimum wage and ask again, how many workers do you have now? So measuring the employment change is easy. Asking how many of them are the same workers and, and what has happened to those two. That's a, difficult, that's a difficult question to ask and those surveys haven't been run. I just want to clarify a little. I'm in uh, political science, mm -hmm. and I think there have been studies, I mean, controlling for these factors and finding that these industries are seeing benefits from less turnover and better trained workers because they're sticking around. I don't know what stories you're referring to, but you have to see the challenge in making that assertion. That is, if raising the wages provided the employer with benefits, a more effective workforce, you might think that at least some employer would have figured that out on their own and figured out how to do it without having the law pass that forced them to do it. So the idea that they just hadn't gotten this and they needed a law to make them aware of it, that's just a little bit hard to believe. Um, so I guess the specific studies that you're referring to probably need to be looked at to, to verify that. But, you know, it's a challenging presentation, it's a challenging proposition. Thank you. Yeah. All right, um, a written question. In order, uh, this is for you, uh, for the Zacks, in order for workers to share in the gains of productivity, 
Should Boulder County be actively encouraging workers to organize and collectively bargain with their employers? I have a couple responses to that. Um, I think unions actually play a very important and uh, healthy role in an economy, um, and I think um, that role is largely is un <coughs> excuse me underappreciated in our um, contemporary environment. Um, I think, however, that role is exaggerated in public employment, and we need to be careful about that. Um, at the same time, I don't know that I understand there to be a public imperative to encourage private unionization. Um, I think the regulatory regime has to be one that, that provides appropriate protection for private workers who choose to unionize, and I'm not sure we have that uh, nationally. I can't say speak to the local question. Um, and in that sense, to the extent that Boulder County does have any regulatory power over unionization, I would certainly encourage it to make sure that it uses that regulatory power to provide appropriate incentives and protections for private workers who seek to explore the opportunity to collectivize. Thank you. All right, oral question, please. Yes, uh, I'm Harry Hempy. I'm uh, the Green Party candidate for governor of Colorado. And I advocate two positions. The first is a livable minimum wage, but not just for cities and not just for towns and government employees, but for the general population of Colorado. Uh, so I, I would ask you to include that in your conversations. And secondly, as Claire mentioned uh, early on, uh, the right of towns and cities in Colorado to have their own minimum wage uh, needs to be respected and, th and that prohibition needs to be taken out of state law. Uh, Boulder County, we can do more to help the minimum wage situation than uh, the state of Colorado can. Uh, finally, thanks for the League, to the League of Women Voters for probably the best debate on uh, the wage problem in Colorado that we're going to have the whole election season. Thank you. Uh, Hickenlooper and Beaupre will not deal with this in their economic uh, development debates, so thank you for doing it. Thank you. I'm not sure that was a question. <laughs> and comments are comments. fine. Comments are fine. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead to another question, a written one, uh, again for you, Professor Zacks. If, hypothetically, parents and society took responsibility for encouraging skill accumulation, as you, uh, as you suggest, and everyone in turn was highly educated and capable of performing intellectually challenging work, who then would be responsible for janitorial work and other less desirable work? <laughs> would they still deserve a low wage despite their high skills? Do I really just have a minute for this? <laughs> no, two, you get two. Okay. Uh, so, it is probably the case that in a world like that, where most everybody had high skills, um, the few people who remained and did what were still low-skilled jobs would be paid relatively highly, and that would be appropriate. There wouldn't be very many of them. There would be a lot of people who wanted their services. It would be fine if they got paid well for that. At the same time, you would expect those kinds of jobs in that kind of environment to be very heavily mechanized. If any of you have a robo vacuum cleaner, for example, you would imagine a world where everybody has a master's degree. You'd also imagine a world where pretty much everybody's got a robo vacuum cleaner. Uh, so um, there would be two responses, in other words. Uh, in fact, I guess there's possibly a third as well, um, and this would depend a little bit on the balance of political power, but uh, you know, as ugly as it might sound to say so, you might find wealthy people finding ways to import low-skilled workers um, from other economies so as to provide them with less expensive access to workers who will do low-skilled jobs. Um, in fact, that is to some degree what we have right now. That's to some degree where the, our immigration issues arise from. Um, but I, I, the, if the intent of the question was to say that a world in which everyone had a master's degree or more would be one in which like low-skilled tasks wouldn't be taken care of, I don't believe that at all. Well, to the contrary, um, people would be in a position to spend more money on getting those kinds of jobs taken care of, and if that meant they had to pay $50 an hour to their plumber or $90 an hour to their plumber or whatever that was, they'd pay it, and good for the plumber. All right, uh, yes sir, oral question. Yeah, I think one of the biggest problems that have not been addressed yet is uh, 
property that you can raise the minimum wage to $50 an hour and if uh, rents are $2,500 like in San Francisco, it's not going to make any difference unless we start working on stabilizing rents, mortgages, and everything. It doesn't matter what the minimum wage is. If rents $500 less than your than your gross pay a month, you're going to be in poverty anyway. So we need to stabilize and maybe bring rent control, which is against state law too. If we don't do both and stabilize rents, we can raise the minimum wage as high as we want, and people aren't going to notice a better standard of living. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to address that? Well, I, I do actually want to respond to that uh, because I think he makes a very important point um, with regard to the city of Boulder. Um, I don't know what exactly the target would be here for a minimum wage. I don't know what multiple of the federal poverty level it would be, but I would bet that anything that would be politically palatable and financially feasible probably wouldn't allow somebody to that is um, under that living wage to buy a house here. So that is a very important issue to raise. It's something that the city also needs to spend some time addressing. A written question? If education above high school is more important today, why are individuals with skills in higher education with, without a degree excluded from higher wages? Can educational qualifications be certified by allowing testing instead of a college degree? I think they can be certified. Uh, outside of uh, the, the usual channel of getting credentials and so forth. The reason, well, you know, this is touching upon the, the relationship between supply side and demand side. I mean, the, the reason why, I think folks are alluding to this, uh, the, the one problem that folks face, especially in a city like this, is that they're not return, getting returns on their education here. And it's not a matter of simply investing more in their human capital, but the reality is that the number of good paying jobs are shrinking. Uh, they're going away. And so it, it it's a much more complicated situation than uh, a lot of models would suggest. And so I, I think this is what they're referring to. I've heard some other person mention this also, that the problem of people with good educational credentials not receiving returns that you would expect. And I, I believe it's a demand side explanation that the, the, the quality of jobs today is just not what it was in the past. That the, that the middle class jobs from the manufacturing sector that we traditionally relied upon are shrinking. And it is more and more difficult to uh, get the kinds of returns persons expected from investments in education. But you know, again, it, it, there might be alternative means of, of, uh, of acquiring those skills today. That's, that's something we're all exploring today as educators. I'm going to have to disagree. I don't think that's where the problem is at all. Um, the high school dropout rate in the United States is 20% or greater. You know, so long before you get to the question of whether or not people with BAs are getting jobs like that, that are match their expectations, 20% of our current high school students do not get their high school degrees. What do they? What do any of us think is going to happen to them? Um, and what what help is there for them if they haven't even gotten that far in, in an economy that looks like that? Um, you know, that and that number far that number is the biggest number we've heard heard all day. Um, and the state of Colorado is particularly bad at bringing students through that high school degree. And on top of that, that number is inflated by the GED, which economically has no value. That is, the increasing use of the GED is another example of how the ability of our students to get through the high school graduation level has degraded. You know, those people are going to give us unemployment problem long before we have to worry about whether people with bachelor degrees are employed in quite the splendor that they anticipated. Thank you. An oral question. So I have general comments for the whole room. But first, I have a question for you. How many of you saw on the news a few days ago the story about the woman on the East Coast who fell asleep in her car in a convenience store parking lot? And the reason she was napping there is because she was working three different jobs. Anyone hear this? Four different jobs, sorry. So, and she died. She died, her car was malfunctioning, and she died in her car. She spilled gas in 
So my, um, I, I work for the Sister Carmen Community Center in Lafayette, we're a family resource center. We serve over 2,500 unduplicated families a year, many of whom are actually working despite your big circle over on the right. And many of them are actually working many, many jobs, two, three, four jobs, to try to make ends meet, and they still have to come for, to us for assistance. But the reason that I'm here is because Sister Carmen has a thrift store. I'm sorry, I'm going to go over and I apologize. <laughs> we have a thrift store. It's a retail environment. It provides income for our services. And for the last eight or nine years, we've been paying five, four to five dollars more than minimum wage. This year, we decided, wait, we decided that we were going to raise all of our thrift store employees to at least $14 an hour. That's $29,120 a year and then by next July everyone in our organization including our thrift store employees would be making $31,000 I forget what it is but $15 an hour if we can do it as a nonprofit other businesses can do it and that's why I'm here I don't know if it's livable wage I don't know if it's minimal wage but I just want to advocate and say that if we as a nonprofit can do it other businesses can too Um, so I think this is for you for the next. Um, so your premise of employers exploiting employees was quickly discounted by asking an employer if this is true. How about asking high-skilled employers, employees, if they are all exploited? If an employer continues to make more money and employees' um, income income stalls or flattens or decreases, they are being exploited. How did you justify discounting that from your first press? <coughs> That's not really um, the definition of exploitation. Um, again, what, what a person's labor is worth is what the value of it is to those who consume the fruits of it. Um, and that's determined by a variety of things, uh, including how much someone else would ask to do the same kind of work. Um, if the if now do in any do we occasion do we do we as individuals find ourselves in positions where we feel like we're undervalued? Yes, I think it's a pretty common experience, and I know I've experienced it as well. Although I answered a question about that in the in the break incorrectly. Um, what happens when when you feel undervalued? You move. Um, that's actually the natural progression of a career. Uh, and that's where people find that a lot of their income growth comes from. So do people feel like they're underpaid? Yes. Is that exploitation? Yes. 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 No. Yes. No. It's, a, it's exploitation if for some reason you are coerced into accepting it. If you are, for, if you are denied the opportunity to leave, to find other jobs, then it's coercion. Then it's, then it's exploitation. But if your employer is temporarily taking advantage of you, and that surely happens, um, you have a response, which is to say, I'm worth more than this, and I'm going to find another job. Uh, and if you, don't, uh, if you don't take advantage of that response, then you have to understand that you are, to some degree, cooperating. So exploitation is an easy word to throw around. It's a hard word to use in a way that's careful and meaningful. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Uh, I, I, I want to. Oh, I, I go just ahead. want to put a, thank you. Just a, a slight gloss on on one aspect of Professor Zax's uh, response. I agree with actually a lot of it, but except the part that if you don't like what you're getting paid or you don't like the way you're treated, just go somewhere else. And I think what that really ignores is the nature of the labor market right now and the fact that many people actually don't have anywhere else to go. There isn't an abundance of jobs, and many people actually do put up with very exploitive working environments. They put up with sexual harassment. They put up with all kinds of things um, because they don't feel that they have any choice. So I know in, in the world of pure economic theory, we have a perfectly fluid labor market, and supply and demand comes to some mag magic equilibrium, but in the real world, it, it really doesn't quite work that way. Some people truly are trapped in a job. Yes. Thank you. Um, question now. 
Yes, I'm Dr. Thomas, and I'm not a sociologist, but I am a student of occupational safety and health and a, and a practitioner of occupational safety and health. And I would just offer two comments on the work conditions <coughs> of some of these people. And the first is that uh, one of the laws that at the time people thought was really progressive that was just going to put everybody out of business after the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. And that started out as the walsh Healy Public Contracts Act. So it started out, it was just for companies that had federal contracts. And now we accept that as the base, basic basement level of workplace health and safety. And most, the majority of companies strive to do better than all. And my second comment in my last 20 seconds is that uh, very often companies will try to contract their labor needs out to another company and then sub, 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 sub. And it gets to be this tangled web. And OSHA, I don't work for them anymore, but they want you to know that you can't contract away your legal responsibilities to protect employees if you, in fact, are the creating or the controlling employer. So those are just a couple of uh, perspectives on the workplace health conditions and safety conditions of these workers. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this question is for Claire. Um, what would be required to change state laws prohibiting cities to raise minimum wages? Well, there's a glib answer, which is round up 33 votes in the House, 18 votes in the Senate, and get a governor to sign the bill. Um, that's the glib answer. Um, it, it's, um, I mean, it really, it, it actually, there's, it's not much more complicated than that. It's a political question. And, um, and it would take some political will. And um, so it's a question of organizing. It's a question of getting some resources to do community education. Um, I mean, it, you know, that's, that's a political question and the answer is a political answer. There's, there's no constitutional prohibition against repealing that. The, the constitutional provision that sets a statewide minimum wage um, does not address the issue of whether uh, cities and counties can have different uh, minimum wages. But um, you know, it, just, it really does depend on the political climate. Thank you. Uh, smoking question, please. All right. So, um, I am a minimum wage employee, and I work 40 hours a week, and um, let's just say I try my best, you know, I really do. But um, I just kind of have a question, I just want to throw it out there, just a ballpark figure, but um, how much are taxpayers paying to substitute or support welfare or Medicaid, food stamps, all that good stuff, for people who can't afford basic cost of living? And wouldn't it be more beneficial for the people making 320% the federal po poverty level or maybe even 200% the federal poverty level, just to, you know, be fair, to pay the worker, to pay the workers a living wage. So, I think what you're alluding to is the fact that when people earn the minimum wage and it's not enough to meet their basic needs. Um, they're basically um, socializing those costs and asking taxpayers to make up the gap between what they're paying their employees and, and what, it, what they require to survive. So um, now you're eligible for Medicaid, which is publicly taxpayer financed health care if you make less than 138% of federal poverty level. I imagine you make less than 138% of federal poverty level. So your employer um, doesn't have to pay you very much, but all of us, the taxpayers of this country and of this state, uh, are paying for your health care. Uh, we may be, if you have a family, we may be paying for a supplemental nutrition assistance program, food stamps. Uh, we may be paying for many things so that your employer can enjoy the benefits of higher profits and lower wages. Thank you. I'm going to break the moderator rule here real quick and just say, um, Community Action Program does a circles campaign and on September 25th we have a Cliff Effect Forum. And we did some research and Boulder County pays over $136 million a year 
and Medicaid and food stamp costs and TANF and those type of things. So give you a number, 136 million or more. Okay, uh, written question. Employers must pay the cost of all the inputs uh, they're going to need to the provision tax. One such input is labor. The cost of this input is what it takes to sustain the workers, his or her family, in a dignified manner. The, um, the, the, to the fact that the true cost, why do you disregard this input? So the, if the cost of this input is to keep them living in, in the dignified manner, why do we disregard that? Because I'm, excuse me. I don't see that that's the employer's responsibility. The employer is responsible for paying for the services that he gets from the worker. Um, if the worker is married, has many children, has dependent parents and so forth, I don't understand why that's the employer's concern. And if it is the employer's concern, then doesn't that tell you that the employer is going to disproportionately try to hire people who don't have families so they don't have to worry about bearing the expense of uh, supporting the worker's family as well? Um, I, don't, I, I think, on the contrary, I think most of us would prefer to have an employer who actually didn't know that much about our family. I'd like, you have, I'd like to have an employer relationship where your employer didn't intrude on your private life to that degree. And unfortunately, in the United States, the way we've managed our health care, the way we've mismanaged our health care, we actually have created an environment where not only does your employer know about your family, but your employer defines your family. That is, your employer gets to tell you who your partner is and who yours and who isn't. And you have to ask yourself, do you really want your job to intrude in your private life in that way? That doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense economically. Uh, so no, it's a, it's a, to me, again, what the employer pays for is the value of the work, not the consumption obligations that the worker might carry along with him or her. One more question, but time is really coming to an end. Go ahead. Good, I stood up and I wrote a question that's not coming up. And I um, I was just wondering if you have a table um, of like what are the negative consequences of overpay for CEOs? Because and I don't know where I'm going to be, but like it's, I've seen several tables where it's like CEO pay have gone up. 300% and minimum wage is going down. It, it, it's just among like the, for small businesses, I can get like, you know, cleaning uniforms or replacing uniforms, you know, once a year instead of, you know, every six months. But for really big corporations, slash the CEO, and it, it's just ridiculous. And I don't know that there's an answer without it being policy or whatnot, but. I'm sure there's a, we can make a long list of things that, that go wrong with society when, when you have an over, over, rightly overpaid. So I have two responses to that. First, I absolutely agree with you. At the very top end, CEOs are vastly overcompensated in economic terms, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that they have, they're not operating what you would think of as a competitive market. They have a stranglehold of economic power over the resources that flow through their, uh, their corporations, and they divert a lot of that to their personal use in a way that is economically inefficient as well as reprehensible. There's no, I, I don't disagree with you on that at all. I don't actually see the connection to the current issue. That is, I don't see the living wage in particular or any other proposal that's currently being discussed as one which says, take this money from the CEO and give it to the workers at the bottom end. And I don't actually see a way to construct a policy that would actually do that effectively. Um, so while I agree what's going on with CEOs is an outrage, the right response to that is probably not going to have any measurable impact on the incomes and well-being of the low-skilled worker. Yeah. I guess I'm just saying the money there. So um, I have to give Angelique the last question. She is our host, the Boulder Chamber. Thank you so much for hosting us. You get the last question. Thank you being here. Um, it was really great having you all in our house. I actually have a very localized um, question, which I see that uh, Nathan Cowles, our, one of our councilmen, is in the house, and so is Sam Weaver. I used to be on city council, and I'm aware of the gap between what the city pays for for services and what it collects taxes on. So the city has a, a, um, an issue, a revenue issue, where the gap between what they collect taxes on and what they have to spend going out gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
So if you can collect the same amount of taxes, these expenses go up and up and up and up. And I'm just contemplating how does that sort of work in with how a living wage and then what the city has to pay for services, should pay for services, how does that play into the city's budgeting process and how it determines its priorities? I know none of the panelists can answer that question. So I think it really is. City Council? To the Council members to consider it, but I think it's part of this dialogue as we we're looking at it for the city of Boulder specifically. And I, 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 maybe that question was addressed, you know, as a thought provoking question for Nathan and Sam to take back to City Council, but I, I would say that. There, there have been a lot of studies of the effect of living wages in other municipalities and what effect it did have on the budget, what effect it had on the cost of providing services. By and large, those studies show that cities vastly overestimated the cost to them of implementing a, city, a, a living wage. And in fact, um, it had a negligible impact on the overall budget. What they found was that there was more competition to bid for city contracts. Uh, they found that the, the labor costs of those contracts were actually small relative to all the other costs. So the small increment of additional cost on wages was, you know, was not significant in terms of the overall cost of the contract. And in some instances, contracting costs went down because there was more competition to bid for those. But I think it's very, very important in the question you raised that City of Boulder has to go through all the same very, very um, careful analysis of the economic impact that many other municipalities went through before deciding whether to move forward to make sure it's a good idea. Thank you. I, I want to thank all of you for spending the evening with us and for participating in this beginning community <coughs> conversation about living wage. Please join me in thanking our panelists. I'm Megan Groves, I'm a Boulder City Council, and it's always important to me after a session like this, where we go from here, because I'm hearing your question, Angelique. The City Council has referred to the, the Human Relations Commission, um, the issue of fair wages in our town, and to look at whether or not the city contracting workout is resulting in people being unfairly treated, unfairly paid, and also um, hired on a part-time basis and kept just strictly under 30 hours so that um, so the benefits are not required. And we, we've done this because, you know, everything in Boulder has a long process to it, but we, it, it, was, it was really very um, illuminating for me to hear Professor Zach set out the economic arguments on, on why we have low wages. But I think in the city of Boulder, with our politics and what we do with respect to city programs and services and county programs, is we, there's a, there is a moral character to it. There's a social contract that we have. And people like you, residents in Boulder, are always reminding one another and also of us, your elected officials and the appointed officials like um, Shirley and Nikrit, we're here, maybe there are others from the Human Relations Commission, but there's important work going on right now. And if this is an interest that's of importance to you, what you should be doing is appearing before both the, the public comment part of the Human Relations Commission meetings, and your meetings are? Third Monday of the month at 6 p.m. Open comment is right at the beginning. So third Monday of every month, you can go to the Human Relations Commission and speak of your concern, tell your stories, what you're doing. Actually, I've been approached by two local businesses, um, McGuckin and the pedestrian shop, by their owners to talk about having a living wage in the city of Boulder because they see what the drive for low cost goods, like with Walmart, is doing, first of all, to their customers, and secondly, um, than what it does to wages in town. 
The other thing that you uh, can do is come to the city council. We have open comment also at 6 o'clock on the first and third Tuesdays of every month and tell the council about your concern. Um, we'll be deciding a new set of priorities for the city to work on in January of this year. So this is a great time to start. The Human Relations Commission may tee this issue up and the council may uh, carry it on. But it's important for you to do that and express your feelings. Um, of course, on both sides, we accept challenges from um, from our community, and we'll figure out the right thing to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. for saying that. Uh, I, I also want to, before we leave, uh, recognize my fellow commissioner, Jose Benteza, who's also on the planning committee for this, and then also um, Carmen Angelano, who staffs the Human Relations Commission. She and her team um, help make this all possible. So, um, thank you all for joining us. If you haven't already, please, uh, there's a sign-in sheet in the back because we want to be sure you're involved in any upcoming public forums about this uh, issue. There's also sign-in sheets downstairs. Um, and one last thing, if you could help us pick your chair up and just take it to the back so we need to clear this room.